Hey, welcome back to another session of Understanding Revelation. Today we're on chapter 5, and the topic is the Lamb and the Scroll. To give you kind of an introduction to today and kind of give you a, a little bit of understanding of where we're going, if you've ever seen a movie or read stories about great military campaigns, uh, what you sometimes will see is the army marching through the city with family members, friends, the community on each side, and they're cheering, you know, their banners, their drums, trumpets. Uh, there's excitement about their military going off to war and defending the city or defeating the enemy, uh, conquering. And so there is this excitement of, you know, and really uh, support that they're going to go accomplish what needs to be accomplished. That's where we're going with chapter 5. You're going to see this great excitement of a conquering uh, army, conquering king. Verse 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, is a pivot in the book of Revelation. It's, there's, this is where there's a transition taking place. We looked in chapters 2 and 3 at, at the seven churches, and that was what was going on in the first century. Now, we are looking into the future. John has received a revelation of what is going to take place in the last days. And uh, verse 1 says this, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. We looked at chapter 4 last week. Today's chapter 5, verse 1, says this, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. In ancient times, a scroll was a legal document. Okay, so this is a picture of God the Father handing God the Son a legal document. And what this legal document, document is, it's the title deed of earth. It is the authority, it's the ownership of earth. And so what we're seeing here is that God the Father is saying to God the Son, okay, the first time I sent you, I sent you to suffer and die and to redeem mankind from their sins. This time I'm sending you to reign and rule over the earth. I'm going to send you to the earth. And, and before you rule the world in righteousness, you need to judge the world and remove evil. And so he is handing God the Son the legal ability to do that. It's the document of authority. It's the title deed of the earth. And within this scroll describes the judgment and the coming kingdom and the coming king. Okay, And so as each seal is broken, we see another step of what is going to take place. Verse 2, and I, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? The angel is saying, Who has the legal right? Who has the authority to pour judgment upon the earth? To take over the earth, to remove Satan, and to establish a thousand-year reign. Who has that right? Who has that authority? Who has that power? Do Old Testament saints have that? Moses, Abraham, how, or even David himself? Or how about New Testament saints, whether it's the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, anyone alive today? How about uh, any angels? Can any of them come to earth remove uh, evil, judge e evil, and establish a thousand-year reign? And the answer to that is no. There is no one worthy to do that. Imagine with me, uh, let's say uh, you may have heard of squatter communities. I've seen those in South Africa. Or even today, you'll see that in America where there are homeless communities and they will live in parks, okay? Okay. I cannot go into a park, a city park, and remove the squatters from the park. I don't have the right. I don't have the authority. 
I don't have the power. But the city and the police department, they have the right, they have the authority and the power to remove squatters from a city park. I saw this in South Africa where uh, immigrants from other countries would live in a certain area and create a community. It's pure poverty. It's awful. And I can't remove them, but the government can. Okay, And so God uh, gives Jesus the Son, God the Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the authority, the power, the right to remove the squatters from the earth. Who are the squatters? Satan and his demons. All that are evil and follow him, they will be removed. They'll be judged and removed from the earth, and he will establish his kingdom in righteousness. Verse 3 says, And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. There's no one that has the ability to judge the earth. And no one knows the future except the Lord. Now, why was John weeping here? Why did he start weeping? Well, maybe because uh, he was just told he was going to see the future, that he was going to have his great revelation, right? And all of a sudden now this revelation comes to a halt, and he's not going to see what happens. And maybe he's sad he's not going to see the end of the story. Or maybe he's all, another reason why he's sad is because he's disappointed that wickedness isn't going to be judged. And Jerusalem isn't going to be restored. And he isn't going to see the second coming of Christ. And again, this would have brought great sour, sorrow, sorrow to him. And, and so he starts to weep. Verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So this wise elder consoles John. He says, listen, mere mortal, you don't have to be sad. There is someone worthy to open up the scroll and to carry out its judgments. And to, someone's able, has the right power and authority to do what this scroll is uh, uh, needing to be carried out. And so he says, there's the lion of the tribe of Judah. A lion is a symbol of the Jewish Messiah. This is the son of God. He's the root of David. It's interesting here that Jesus Christ is the descendant of David. Remember, Jesus of Nazareth it was a descendant, a physical descendant of David. But here it says the root of David. When I think of a root, a root produces what's above, right? And so the image here is that Jesus was before David, and, and Jesus produced David. And yet later on, the, the physical uh, Jesus came uh, later. But he's the root of David. And what's po most important here is that he conquered. He conquered death and sin. He, he, he has full authority over all in the heavens and on earth. And so he is conquered. It's a complete conquering. And Satan's reign on earth is coming to an end. And so remember, remember the, the uh, image I started off with, with the army marching through a city. Drums are beating. Trumpets are blowing. People are cheering. They know that whatever is out there is going to get conquered. The evil out there, the threat is going to get ended. Their reign is going to end because our army is going out there to take care of it. And this is what's taking place right now. He's saying, listen, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's conquered. He's won the victory. Now he's going to go up and return to the earth and, and fulfill, carry out his victory on the earth. Verse 6, And between the throne and the four living creatures... And among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. So he says, there's a lion of the tribe of Judah. So John looks, and instead of seeing a lion, he sees a lamb. The lion and the lamb are the same. And of course, this is a symbol of the Messiah, of, the, of God the Son. 
I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And so what is the symbol? What is the, the symbolic uh, a symbol of the power of the kingdom of God? When you think of Russia, their symbol of strength is a bear. When you think of Britain, their symbol of strength is a lion. France has a symbol, their symbol of strength is a tiger. When you think of the United States of America, what is our symbol of strength? It is a bald eagle. And so the symbol of heaven is a slain lamb. Boy, doesn't that just get you all scared? But that lamb is also a lion. And so why is he called a lamb? Of course, a lamb is a picture that is throughout the scriptures, through Old Testament and New Testament. Jesus is compared to a lamb in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Remember the apostle, or not the apostle, but the prophet John the Baptist called Jesus, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is compared to a lamb 28 times. So this is a very important image, symbol of Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting when you think about the lamb and about the blood of the lamb, it makes us realize what is taught throughout scripture. Let me just give you a few uh, insights into the lamb, okay? We can only approach God We can only approach the throne of God in prayer through the blood of the lamb. The lamb was a substitute that takes away sin. Sin satisfies justice. Remember, the wages of sin is death. The only way justice can be fully uh, uh, appeased is through blood. Hebrews 9 talks about how there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Only God can provide the lamb. Remember when Abraham went to the mountain of Moriah to sacrifice Isaac, and Isaac's like, hey, we got the wood, we got the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said to his son Isaac, God himself will provide the lamb. This is Genesis chapter 22. And on Mount Moriah, which is in Jerusalem, uh, Remember, he's about ready to sacrifice his son Isaac because that's what God commanded him to do because the Lord was testing him. He passed the test. The angel stops him, and he looks over, and there, sure enough, was a lamb, a wild ram caught in a thicket. And that's how the Lord provided. Then you fast forward into the Old Testament, and in Egypt, what had to be sacrificed in order for the death angel to pass over a home? A lamb had to be sacrificed. The blood of the lamb had to be put on the doorpost. And in Egypt, while uh, the Egyptian firstborn were being killed by the the death angel, the Jews' uh, families were spared. Why? Because of the Passover lamb. There's something about the chain of blood. Remember, as you fast forward through Old Testament, God raised up Levites. What were the Levites supposed to do? They were to offer lambs as sacrifices, substitutes to pay for the sins of the nation. And the place where Abraham sacrificed the lamb instead of Isaac on Mount Moriah was where the temple was built in Jerusalem. And that's where sacrifices were continued. And then you fast forward to Isaiah chapter 53. And Isaiah talks about a new human lamb. A new human lamb. This is not the lambs that they were being sacrificed in the uh, the Old Testament. Now all of a sudden, this lamb becomes a human. Look what it says in Isaiah chapter 53. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. We've all sinned. The Apostle Paul says the same thing. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But even though we turned our backs on God, he took our sins and put them on his son, Jesus Christ. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter 
and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And so here in Isaiah 53, remember this is written about 700 years before Jesus of Nazareth was even born. Okay, Isaiah's prophesying there is a human lamb, a lamb of God that will take away the sins of the world. I encourage you to read the rest of Isaiah 53 if you've never read it before. It is an incredible prophecy about the death of Jesus Christ. Now, why did this lamb have to be sacrificed? Why did Jesus Christ have to die on the cross? Why weren't the lambs in the past good enough? Well, the Bible clearly teaches, for example, in Hebrews 10, that the blood of animals was not sufficient. They couldn't fully remove sin from us. Let me illustrate this way. All of us have sinned, and we are in debt to God. So let's just use an imaginary uh, dollar amount to help you understand what I'm saying. Our sins create a debt with God. It's like we owe God a trillion dollars, each one of us. We owe God a trillion dollars because of our sins. Our crime occurred a fine. Okay, I'm using money just to help illustrate this. Our, Our sins in the courtroom of heaven demanded us to pay a fine. And that fine was a trillion dollars per person. And it's impossible for us to pay heaven back. Okay? And so what did God do in the Old Testament? In the Old Testament, he allowed the Old Testament saints to sacrifice an animal, a lamb, to pay to cover the sins. And what that did was it paid the minimum payment. So if you've ever been in debt with a credit card, you know that you can pay the credit card off in full and you're debt free, or you can pay the minimum payment. And that appeases the judgment of the bank for a month. Okay, are you with me? And so we get our credit card statement and it says we sinned and we deserve or we have to pay the courtroom of heaven one trillion dollars well we can't do that so god the father says to the old testament saints i want you to sacrifice a lamb and that pays the minimum payment that appeases the judgment of god for a time and so for centuries lambs animals were sacrificed to pay off god appease god's judgment temporarily it was, but it did not fully satisfy the judgment of God, the wrath of God. When Jesus shows up as the human lamb, he fully pays off our trillion dollar debt that we owe to the courtroom of heaven. I hope that makes sense because that's going to help you truly appreciate your free gift of eternal life. And so that debt is paid. Okay, Jesus fully pays for that on the cross. Jesus became a human lamb, and he alone could fully satisfy the wrath of God. And he became our substitute. He took our death. He took our punishment. He took God's wrath for us. Remember, Jesus was sinless. He was a perfect lamb. He had no spots, no sin. And 1 Peter chapter 1 talks about how he's pure. Why is that important? It's important because a human who is on death row cannot die for someone else who's also on death row. And all human beings are are on death row in the courtroom of heaven. We've been declared guilty because of our sin. We deserve death. And, and, and if I'm going to have to die for my sins, I sure cannot die for someone else's sins or your sins. Okay? Even though I may be a good guy, I am not worthy enough to die for your sins. Jesus was the only human in all of history who lived on earth and was sinless. Number four, another thought here that I want you to be aware of is that Jesus was submissive and silent like a lamb. He submitted to the mission that God gave him. And I want you to go and drink my cup of wrath. Take my wrath upon you. 
And then, and then Jesus died as our Passover lamb. It's an incredible gift of God. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 5. Verse 6, And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns. Remember, seven is the perfect number. It's a number of completeness. It's a number of fullness. It's a number of perfection. And so what are horns? Remember horns? We've talked about this before. They are a symbol of strength, of power, of authority. And so Jesus has the complete, full, adequate power and authority to uh, uh, carry out the mission of God when he returns. Now it says here that there are seven eyes on this lamb, which are the seven spirits of God. Now this can seem a little confusing, uh, and there are a couple ways of looking at what this symbolizes. One option is that the seven eyes represent the, represent the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, okay? And that can be a great way of looking at this because Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, does give the Holy Spirit seven descriptions. Because of time, I'm going to let you look at that on your own. Isaiah 11, verse 2. And so this could be a... a, a a symbol of the Holy Spirit being sent out into all the earth. And, and during the tribulation, the Holy Spirit will draw many Jews and Gentiles to salvation. So it could be referring to the Holy Spirit, which I think makes the most sense. Some think that the seven eyes uh, represent uh, this perfect scene, this all-knowing God. He, he, nothing escapes him, right? He, uh, no wickedness on earth is going to escape his judgment because he sees it all. You can't hide from this coming judge that's coming. So that, that could be another way of looking at that. Verse 7 of chapter 5. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. This is, of course, God the Father. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So now the Lamb's actions evoke great outbursts in praise and worship. So again, this is the military parade. This is it's coming down. It's finally, finally, after all these centuries, the king is returning to earth. The second coming of Christ is about to take place. This is exciting. And here uh, it shows uh, the prayer of the saints. You know, on earth, the saints are... are um, ridiculed they're they're persecuted but the prayer of saints in heaven are valuable they're precious to the lord they're even in golden bowls verse 9 and they sang a new song saying worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed meaning uh, you paid the price for people to be free from sin you ransom people for God. God. I love that. Jesus purchased us out of the slavery of sin. He saved us from death, from hell, for God, his Father, to bring him pleasure and honor so that we can be with the Lord forever. From every tribe and language and people and nation. And that is happening today as we speak. As you're watching this video, people from all over the world are being rescued from sin and from death. And you have made them a kingdom and a priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. We are going to reign and rule. So they sang a new song. There are a lot of new things that are happening in the book of Revelation. There are new names. There's a new Jerusalem, a new heaven, a new earth. All things will be made new. And here, when it, when it speaks of new, it doesn't necessarily mean um, uh, like a, never created before, but it's more dealing with freshness or quality. It's, a worth, it's something that's worthy, meaning it's, it's excellent. There's power. And, and speaking of, of God, uh, speaking of Jesus here, he is worthy. He is, he is uh, a majestic person. 
And of course, we talked about how he redeems us. We belong to God. Let's go to verse 11. It says this, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads of thousands and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice. This is just an enormous amount of angels. Can you imagine the volume? You know, have you heard people say at church, it's too loud? Well, in heaven, it's going to be loud, especially at this point. This is the battle cry. This is the marching of troops. This is, let's get our weapons together. Let's, because the king of kings is going to judge the earth and he's going to return. Things are happening. Worthy is a lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Just great praises happening in heaven at this point. Verse 13, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, isn't this, isn't this amazing? Everyone now, you see right now, earth and all of the universe has been cursed by sin. Death reigns on earth. Death reigns throughout the universe. And so because of sin, it says in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul talked about how creation is mourning under the curse of sin and how it's longing to be freed from the curse of sin. And so now the drums are beating and, and uh, the trumpets are blowing and, and things are happening. And so creation realizes finally the curse of sin is going to end. Death sickness, suffering is coming to an end. The king of kings is going to return and remove the curse of sin. This is a great, exciting time. And it says there, uh, and the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. And so why, why all the worship? I love what this one commentary says. In vivid and confident terms that the world's destiny is not under the control of some blind fate. We are all in the hands of a loving Father and a Savior who died for all of us. Well, that's Revelation chapter 5. That's the, the all about the Lamb and the scroll. And so I encourage you to now read uh, Revelation chapter 6 and 7. Uh, for our next session, we're going to start looking at uh, the scrolls being opened, and uh, I'm looking forward to what we're going to be studying. I hope to see you at our next session. God bless.